Let's open our Bibles this morning to the book of Acts chapter 4. We have a time of prayer every morning at 6. And as I went home and I was crying out to God, there was a dynamic shift that happened in my heart this morning. Something shifted in my heart. So I stand before you this morning in fear and trembling, having no confidence in what I have to say, but looking to the Father to fill my mouth with that which needs to be spoken. We are at a very important time in the history of the human race. We're about to see the fulfillment and the accomplishment of all of God's dreams and plans and purposes. Back in 2008, the heavens opened up and within three, three and a half minutes, God downloaded inside of me 40 aspects of faith with up to 28 points in each one. And so the Lord here a couple of weeks ago began to release me to proclaim the 20 ways that faith comes. These are not things that were, I was taught by man, but by the Holy Ghost. And I've not really given myself to them, even though I've operated in them to some extent. But over two weeks ago, the Lord spoke to me, said, Now begin to teach and preach and proclaim the way that faith comes, because without faith it's impossible to please Him. And they got, God wants us to step into that realm of faith, and that realm of faith is when this book becomes more real to you than the physical flesh and blood that you live in. The realm of faith is when this word becomes alive and explodes on the inside and it becomes substance to your natural five senses. And so we are actually teaching on the 18th way that faith comes. And as I was meditating upon it yesterday and this morning, something shifted, something changed, something happened in the depths of my innermost being and I felt the fountains of the deep, the living water begin to come forth out of me. Because the fountain of life lives inside, and we're talking about faith in Christ Jesus. And so God is about to reveal his glory, his presence, his reality, his nature, his character to the human race once again. And he always begins it in the hearts of men. He always raises up men and women. He always raises up those who are holy and separated and consecrated and committed and sold out to him like stock and barrel. Those who are obsessed and possessed and consumed with nothing but a desire to please him who has rescued them and who has bought them with his precious blood and set them free. They're not of this world. They're just strangers and pilgrims passing through the land. And many times as I have been on that precipice, I have been on that edge where all of a sudden the flesh begins to die. It begins to wither up and it begins to blow away like a leaf, in the, a dry leaf in the mighty wind. I begin to back off because the flesh trembles in that place of holiness where the fire of heaven begins to burn and consume and overwhelm you. And it's like the fire that comes from heaven that consumes the stubble and like a hammer that breaks the rocks in pieces. And it's his word hid in your heart. And so we must recognize that we live in a time of great unbelief. But I want you to know that where iniquity abounds, grace does much more abound. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard against him. I want you to know that God is about ready to raise up a standard. When Christ had come to the earth in the fullness of time, he was revealed. It tells us that literally that there had been such a period of deadness, spiritual dryness for over 400 years, not an open vision, not a prophetic word, not a dream. And all of a sudden the angel of the Lord appeared to Mary and gave her the blessed word you're about to conceive within your womb and you're about to give birth to Emmanuel, God, in the midst of us. And then, of course, Zacharias and then all of a sudden John the Baptist and he comes forth, but... For 30 years after Mary gave birth, we had not heard a word except for when he was 12 years old when he said, I must be about my father's business. And then, of course, we've seen the awesome ministry in the life of the works of Christ. And then he 
died and he was ro raised from the dead and then he ascended up to heaven and he gave a commission to his church and he made some amazing promises and I want us to take a look because we're talking about the 18th way that faith comes. The 18th way that faith comes. See, God wants our hearts to be filled with faith, trust, confidence, reliance, dependence upon him. He doesn't want us to live. See, it's only faith that will take you into the realm of the Spirit. He therefore that worketh miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? He wants us to be obsessed and possessed and consumed and filled and flooded. He wants our vessels to be full of the oil of faith, confidence in him. For Jesus said, thy faith has made thee whole. Your trust in me, Jesus said, your confidence in me, your reliance on me, your dependence on me, it's the only thing that will overcome the flesh and crucify the old man. Faith in Christ. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith in Jesus. Hallelujah. Our faith in Christ, not our faith in man, not our faith in the flesh, not our faith in our intellect, not our faith in our education, not our faith in our programs, not our faith in our buildings, not our faith in ourselves, but faith in Christ overcomes the world, the flesh, and the devil. And that faith is in us. We talked about how every man who came into the world had faith. Child, the faith of a child. Take a look what it says here in Acts chapter 4. This is right after the uh, <clears throat> Peter and James and John and the disciples have been released because there had been a man at the gate beautiful that Peter said, silver gold have we not, but such as we have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Five thousand got converted. And he said, why look upon us as if by our holiness this man has been made whole, but faith which is by him in Christ has made this man whole. And then after they've been released in verse 29, I want you to listen to this amazing prayer. And actually, I've got it taped to this pulpit. Listen to this, because I believe it is, a, it is a declaration what God is about to do in the midst of the human race. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and Notice, notice the mockings going on in our society, in the world today. Behold their threatenings and grant unto thy slaves, thy servants, thy bond servants, that with all boldness they may speak thy word. When the Holy Ghost is moving in the heart of a man, there will be a boldness that is beyond the natural flesh. By stretching forth thine hand to heal. Now listen, this is a prayer that is inspired by heaven. This is faith speaking through them. By stretching forth thine hand to heal, that signs and wonders, signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Say, be filled with the Holy Ghost. You can only be filled with the Holy Ghost when you're full of faith. You'll be full, when you're full of unbelief, you'll be full of fear and worry and torment and anxiety and, and bitterness and hate and, and anger and, and, and lust and, and, and depression. And when, you, when unbelief is dwelling in your heart, you're in a world of hurt. But that's all right because God's about to come and rip the unbelief out. How many are ready for God to rip the unbelief out of your heart? How many are tired of living in the flesh and being a slave to your feelings and your emotions and the, and the, and the fickleness of the human mind? God's about to do what I was speaking on Sunday morning and a prophetic word came out of my belly that even as it was in the days of Noah when God opened up and broke open the, the, the fountains of the deep in 40 days all flesh was covered and the Lord spoke to me he said I'm about to do a quick work that within 40 days when the fountains of the deep come forth I will cover all flesh in my body in my church Hallelujah. I will wipe it out how, how many are ready for the flesh to be wiped out Oh, and he does it suddenly, like this morning as I was in prayer. Suddenly there was a shifting in my heart. I began to feel the fountains of the deep come forth. He says, in the multitude of them that did what? They believed. The multitudes, say multitudes. 
It was not just one or two or three. The multitudes that believed that notice what happened when you believe when faith is flowing and operating when you're walking and living and moving and, and operating in faith. You will have one heart and one soul. Oh, don't you hunger for the time when there is no strife, there is no division, there is no confusion, there is no anxiety, there is no disagreement. In this moment, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. They were full of faith, and they were of one soul, of one mind, of one heart. To what? To love the Lord thy God. Amen. Oh, I long, I hunger, I thirst for that blessed visitation from heaven. Where the body, the, the body, the body, the body, the body, the bride, the church is filled with one heart, one soul, one mind, one purpose. And that's to love God with all that is within them and to love each other. For they will know you are my disciples because of your love for one another. And neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own. <laughs> but they had all things common. <laughs> isn't that amazing see that's where faith is exploding that's where faith is growing it is an oasis it is a spiritual garden of Eden all over again upon the face of the earth and we're coming into that moment we're coming into that time I felt like in my heart this morning as I was in prayer like a, like a, like a rocket being launched from NASA and I have left the launch pad praise the Lord <laughs> are you ready to launch are you ready to go to a higher realm, a higher dimension? Are you ready to step into that realm of faith where all things are possible? And notice this verse 33. What a glorious description. What a proclamation. And with great power. Great power. Woo! Great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace, great grace, divine ability was upon them all. Say, upon them all. Go ahead and wave it, told you. Come on, say, come upon me, great grace. Come upon me, great grace. But notice, the great grace did not come. Did you notice nothing happened until they cried out and there was a mighty earthquake that came and it shook the place where they were gathered together? And it says that as they prayed, they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and with great power. And God did awesome things. See, this is, take a look here because this is how faith comes. Take a look in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse, verse, uh, verse 4, please. Listen to what Paul said. This is so important. See, this reveals to us what's been wrong for the last uh, who knows how many years. Notice what it says here in verse 4. And Paul said in my preaching, and my speech was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. It wasn't in, 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 in eloquence. It, it wasn't in, in uh, the proper use of, of, of the vocabulary. It wasn't in natural thinking or philosophies or ideals of men. He said, my preaching, my teaching, my speech was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and the power. Power that the world can understand, that boggles the human mind, that grips the human heart in fear. He said, when I came to you, I did not come to you with a little sermonette for Christian. I didn't come to you with excellency of speech. I didn't come to you. He said, I came to you in fear and, tr and trembling. How? In demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. Why? Why, Paul? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. That church growth will not happen because of a good program, because of a good system, because of a good worship team, because of good preaching. He said that the church might explode in growth. How? 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 Through the demonstration of the Spirit and the power of the living God. 
that your faith would not be built upon the foundation, uh, upon the bedrock, uh, upon philosophies and, and, and ideals and, 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 and theologies of, of, of men, not, not upon uh, the fact of our building is so eloquent, our programs are so wonderful, our singing is out of this world, our, our, our seats are so comfortable, you can go to sleep in them. No, 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 no. The early church was founded upon the bedrock of the power of God. It was the power of God. The power. He said that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, Pastor Mike, how come, how come we're not seeing a mighty move of God? Because faith has been dying in the hearts of men. He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit. Does he do it by the works of law, by the hearing of faith? I was laying in bed last fall, and as I'm laying in bed, and I've had many experiences with God, and I don't exalt my experiences, because Paul said, if I'm going to glory, I'm going to glory in Christ. But I'm laying in bed, and I heard the audible voice of God, and he spoke to me, and he said this, the violent take it by force. I woke straight up from sleep. I heard the voice of God. I was trembling and shaking in bed. Well, you know, sometimes God will speak something, but sometimes it takes a little bit of time for it to catch up to you. You know what I'm saying? You know, sometimes like in a natural, somebody will tell you a joke, and you'll think, okay, big whoopee. And about half an hour later, you go, oh, <laughs> that's what that was about. And sometimes God will speak to you, but it will take some time for it to begin to take a hold of you. Oh, I have great experience expectation I have great anticipation why because I have seen through the eyes of my heart through the eyes of faith that we're about to see God show up like he's never showed up before I'm going to show you why he's going to do it too he said that your faith that your faith would not stand in the wisdom of man but in the power of God so notice he wants our faith to stand in the power of God take a look at biblical history what did Moses do how did Moses cause the Israelites to come into another realm where they walked over the Red Sea on dry sod land? How? By mighty signs and wonders, by an outstretched arm, by the God of, uh, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by the great I Am. That's how he did it. By a mighty sign. How, how did he turn the nation of Israel back to God? Through Elijah calling fire down from heaven and commanding it not to rain for three and a half years. How did God take the, 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 the country of Wales and bring a mighty revival? By mighty signs and wonders. How did God bring revival in the early church? By mighty signs and wonders. See, I, I don't have to try to convince you. I ain't going to try to convince you. I ain't going to try to get you to mentally, emotionally, psychologically agree with me this morning. But I'm telling you what, in order to rip that spirit of selfishness out of you, that spirit of, of, of unbelief out of you, that, that, that where you're just tossed to and fro with every feeling, every emotion, every wave, every doctrine of men, it's going to take the power of God. I'm telling you, God has men and women out there. They've been in the caves. They've been in prayer. They've been faithful. They've been obedient. And God is about to bring them forth. And what, what are they going to be preaching? They're going to preach Jesus is Lord. They're not going to be preaching covetousness and materialism and you can have what you want and, 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 and on and on and on. They're going to be preaching an obsession and a possession where you are willing, you have got to die to everything that gets between you and Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what Jesus said. If, you, if anybody loves his mother, his father, his brother, his sister, his, his own life more than he loves me. He can't be my disciple. Well, how are you going to bring people? That is a radical commitment for people to come to the place to where they were just willing to be forsaken everything. But you know what? Peter, James, and John did it. Why did they do it? We're going to find out why they did it. Look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. How does faith come, Pastor Mike? By mighty signs and wonders. I'm going to show you that without mighty signs and wonders, the majority of people will never get right with God. That's why America is so dead spiritually. That's why so many people in the church are dead. They can't shout. They can't sing. They can't dance. They can't even make it to church Sunday morning. Why? Because they don't have the faith, but mighty signs and wonders and miracles will cause people to come into a place of radical faith. I'm going to prove it to you. 
You know, Jesus was raised from the dead, was he not? And here, Thomas is one of the ones who wasn't there when he was raised from the dead. And, and, and they told him, they said, oh, Jesus is alive, he's alive, he's alive. And Thomas says, I won't believe, I will not believe unless I stick my hand into his, his side and I put my finger into his hand. He said, I won't believe. And a couple of days went by and all of a sudden Jesus showed up. And the minute he showed up among the disciples, he looks right at Downing Thomas. He said, Thomas, yes, Lord. He said, come here. What? Come here. Come here. Give me your hand. What? Stick your hand in my side. Whew. Stick your hand in my side. Now stick your finger in my hand. Oh, no, Lord. Oh, no. He said, and be thou not unbelieving, but be thou believing. Amen. You know what that tells me? He is so desperate for you to believe that he is willing to have you even experience him to where you stick your hand into his side and you put your finger into his hand. Whoa, you, don't, you think God is going to let this generation just up and go to hell? Well, they don't want to get saved, Pastor Mike. Well, they haven't seen mighty signs and wonders. They've seen a lot of shenanigans. Listen, waving your hand and people falling down, that's a sign and a wonder, but that ain't going to get a lot of people saved. They're just going to think you're nuts, that you're, hip, you're, you're, you're hypnotic. But I'm telling you what, man, you pray for somebody with amputated legs and they pop out. You pray for somebody who's been dead and embalmed. You, they'll, they'll, I'm telling you what God is about to do, mighty signs and wonders. Look what it says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 12. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders, and what kind of deeds? Mighty, mighty, deeds. mighty deeds. He says, here's the evidence I'm an apostle. He said, mighty signs and wonders and mighty deeds, amazing deeds, uh, things that will just boggle your mind, that will, that will, you'll go, whoa, I can't hardly believe that. Did that really just happen? Did that really just take place? Was, was, was that some kind of illusion? Was that some kind of trick? Did you see what just happened to that person? No, mighty signs and wonders. Look there in Romans chapter 15, please. How does faith come, Pastor Mike? I'm telling you, we are going to have a deluge. We are going to have a tsunami of faith hit the earth. No, no, no. The harlot church, they won't want it, but the real church, they'll come running in. They are going to see such mighty signs and wonders and mirrors. When, Pastor Mike, suddenly? Suddenly, all, I, all my job. See, the only thing I got to do is get full of faith. The only thing i got to do is take the faith that God has given to me, and I've shared with you so far 18 ways that faith comes, and you can watch them for free, or you can get the DVDs or CDs, and I'm taking these things, and I'm saying, okay, i got to get full of faith. i got to get full of faith. i got to get full of faith. i got to trust. i got to have confidence in Jesus Christ. I've got to look to Jesus Christ. I've got to get my eyes on him. See, this is the thing. Remember, he told his disciples. Remember the, the apostles? They told the, they told the people, they said, we've got to give ourselves in prayer and fasting. Let me tell you right now, the Lord, and the word of God. Let me tell you, brothers, I love you, but I'm going to kind of get a little bit disconnected from you all. You all are just going to have to grow up and deal with some issues here because the Lord is speaking to me. He said, son, you've got to get so full of the word and so full of the spirit and so full of faith and so full of God that I can manifest myself through you. And then it's contagious. We taught that's one of the ways that faith comes, by association. Yeah. You get around some Joshua's, you get around some Caleb's, you get around some David's, and it will get all over you. Yeah. It'll get all over you, praise the Lord. You all want it to get on you. Have you ever got around somebody who, 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 who maybe, I know there's been times when, when my wife would, would put on perfume and I would hug her and I'd walk away from her and I would have that perfume on me, that smell of my wife upon me. Well, that's God, what God, let me tell you something. You get in the reality of Christ. You get in the presence of God. You get, you get, you get before his throne. And let me tell you something. You won't have to tell anybody you've been in the throne room. You won't have to tell anybody you've been in prayer. You won't have to tell anybody you've been in the word. It'll come out of you. They'll smell it, they'll see it, they'll hear it, they'll feel it. It will be in you. Yes. And it would be like a battering ram trying to batter down the unbelief in your heart. That's trying. See, unbelief is trying to separate you from God. Every feeling, every emotion, every attitude, every thought, every ideal, every imagination that, that is against the will of God is trying to get you to run away from Jesus. Oh, my, my, 
my brothers and sisters, those of you watching right now, don't run away from Jesus. He's not your problem. Don't run away from Christ because you got preachers in a pulpit with no power. We are full of hot air, but we ain't got no power. No, run to Jesus. He'll never disappoint you. He'll never let you down. Can I hear some people shout? Jesus! Look what it says in Romans 15, 18. For I will... I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not wrought by me. So I'm, I'm not here to preach about an, another man's experience. He said to make, listen, I love this. This is a revelation. To make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. Now listen, he's going among the Gentiles and Peter went among the Jews. He's going among people and he goes on to say, I went to places nobody else had gone before me because I didn't want to build upon another man's foundation. He's coming to build a foundation of faith in the power of Christ. Let me ask you, most people's faith in Christ, has it really been built on the reality that his word is law? That what he says comes to pass? Most people's faith isn't built on the foundation of the power of Christ. It's built on eloquent preaching, on, you know, on, you know, a uh, little bit here, a little bit there, a touch here, a touch there, but it's not built on the, see, Paul said, I want your faith to be built on the dynamite explosive power that the word of God is, is, is law, and when you speak, it happens. Amen. You know, that, that creates a deep root system. We got some willow trees out here. I planted those willow trees many years ago. We had a storm come through here last year, and one of them willow trees just got rooted right up, fell right over. And, and, and we went out there, we wanted to save it, so we, we, we pulled it back up, and I got it hooked up with the chain to another tree. Right now, I don't want to lose it. But there's other trees that didn't fall over. Why? Because their root system was so deep that no matter how the wind blew, they couldn't get blown over. You know, how, my, how, come, how, my, how come so many people today are just being blown over? Little stupid things get people mad. Come on now, don't look so innocent. You know, things, you get up in the morning and it's raining and it's drizzly and you're miserable and I'm laying in bed all day. And they're not up and at it. You're not going for it. Why? Because your faith has not been established in the power of God. But the early church was. How could they handle all that persecution? How could they just go and sell everything? See, to the degree that stuff has you reveals to the depth of your faith. And, and you know how many people have told me, Pastor Mike, I really believe that God's called me to full-time ministry, but I just can't afford to do it. I'm thinking, well, you can't afford not to do it. <laughs> but you know what? It's okay. It's all right. Because God is about... See, let me tell you something. If some don't believe it, it doesn't matter. God can't deny himself. Every prophetic word that God ever spoke is going to happen. It's already done as far as he is concerned. Amen. Now, I can go ahead and cooperate. I can roll up my sleeves and begin to trust, begin to believe, begin to obey, begin to follow, begin to forsake, begin to deny, begin to crucify my flesh, or I can go ahead and just lay back and suck my thumb and fill my diapers. It's completely up to me. But you know what, man? I pulled the thumb out of my mouth, and I've taken off the diapers, praise God, and i probably got training pants on now, but I am running, praise the Lord. Woo! Listen, how did he bring the Gentiles into a place of obedience to word and deed? For much, they're not just saying, I, I, I know the word. They're doing the word. They're doers. Yeah. Gentiles, heathens. They were devil worshipers. Did you know the Gentiles were devil worshipers? They had false gods. Now all of a sudden they are full-fledged, on fire, Holy Ghost, spirit-filled, tongue-talking people in love with God. How did he do it? In verse 19. Notice how he did this. Through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of the living God. So that from Jerusalem and round about unto Iconium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. How did Paul preach the gospel? He did it in power, in signs and wonders and demonstrations. You know what? 
Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can I tell you something? I'm going to encourage you all, that, and especially you ministers, especially you preachers of the gospel. Let me tell you something. If Paul could walk there, we can walk there. If Paul, if Peter lived there, if Stephen lived there, if Philip lived there, if, if, if Barnabas lived there, if, 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 if they lived there, we can live there. We can live there. You can walk there. You can move there. You can function in that realm of the supernatural, but it's going to take faith. Faith says, God, I give you everything. God, I give you my all. I remember many years ago when the Lord had me going to the Philippines, and we had a mighty move of God in the Philippines, and out of that movement in the Philippines, 27 churches have sprung up, and even more churches are coming forth. But I remember the Lord spoke to me because I was going into a heavy communist area, and, 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 and uh, uh, people, people I knew were getting their heads cut off, Filipinos, and, and, and I was going areas where white men didn't go, and, and the Lord spoke to me as I was in prayer, getting ready to go to the Philippines. He said, son, he said, if I take your life, and I let them martyr you to be a seed of revival, will you let me? Now, I had my, my, my son Michael and Daniel and Stephen and my daughter Stephanie. I loved them so much, and Stephanie was a little girl, and, 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 and I, I wasn't concerned about my house or about the building. Just, and the Lord said, are you willing to give your life to be sown as a seed of revival? And I remember kissing my wife and my kids goodbye, weeping and wailing. I said, Lord, I'm willing to die. I'm willing to die if that's what you want for the Filipinos. And I remember getting in my car and driving towards the airport and I'm weeping so hard I couldn't even see out the windshield. I'm weeping so hard because I literally thought that God was going to let my life be used as a seed of revival in the martyrship over there. And so I went with a complete understanding I'll never come back. And I said goodbye to my precious wife and my children. I said I'll never come back. But it's okay Lord if this is what you want. Well praise the Lord he brought me back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you understand, you cannot experience this depth of faith that I am talking about, this realm of power and authority. See, God ain't just going to give power and authority to anybody because he'd go to their head. They get to thinking they're somebody, not realizing they're nothing. And out of their nothingness, God will bring forth his glory. Hallelujah. He puts these treasures in earthen vessels that the excellency of the glory may be of God and not of us. He'll not share his glory with anybody. Now nah, I've tasted, I've tasted of the heavenly things to come. And let me tell you something, this world has no comparison to it. And I don't want what this world has. All I want is Jesus. See, now my children are growing up, and yes, they're still working with us, and they're still ministering to us. But you know what? Pastor Mike, what if God would ask you to do that again? What if he'd ask you to die? He's not asking me. He's not commanding me. Mike Yeager, you die. You die, you filthy dog. You die to your flesh. You die to your feelings. You die to your emotions. You die to your plans and become alive unto me. I bought you with my blood. You're no longer your own. You are mine alone. And if you will step into that place of death to self, if you will crawl up upon the altar and be a living sacrifice, the fire of heaven will come and consume you and all that will be left is me. Oh, all that will be left is me. You know what? Aren't we fed up with looking at flesh? I don't know about you. I get fed up with my flesh. I, I know some people get more to, fed up with the flesh of others than themselves, and that's nothing but hypocrisy. That's the Pharisee in them. I get fed up with the flesh in Mike Yeager, man. I can't wait to the moment that the fire falls and there is nothing of Mike Yeager left. Praise the Lord. And it's nothing but Jesus in Christ who alive in me, like Paul said. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but it's Christ that lives within me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God Hallelujah. who loved me and gave himself for me. Yes. So he said that he caused the Gentiles to become obedient in word and deed through mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. How are we going to cause people to believe? We can criticize them. We can find fault with them. We can attack them. We can, call, we can go on a crusade against this group and that group and, and that, that group and this group. But listen, that's all Mickey Mouse. That's all that's stupid. That's dumb. You need a revelation. The problem is not them. The problem is you. Hallelujah. The problem is Mike Yeager. If I was where I needed to be, the heathen would believe. The Gentiles would believe. Hallelujah. The atheists would believe. I remember I was holding a tent meeting 
the Lord spoke to me. I was pastoring a church back in 1980, I think it was, in Three Springs, Pennsylvania, and it was coming to my vacation time, and, and Michael wasn't born yet. And what, what year were you born in, Michael? 81. So this 1980, the Lord said, go hold a tent crusade in the Huntington Fair. And, 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 and so I, I said, okay, Lord. And so I called him up and I said, I want a tent space in your Huntington Fair. And they said, well, Reverend, you got to set this thing up two years in advance. Well, let's see if Pastor Mike heard from God. I didn't argue with them. I didn't try to get them. I said, okay, I'll tell you what you do. You go to your board and you ask them and you talk to them and call me back if there's a space. Well, about two days later, they called me back and they said, you know what? They said, we got a spot that we have open next next to the, the fire department bingo place. Now, some people are religious. I don't want to be about, around people that, play, that, that are involved in gambling. Oh, no, that's where I want to be. I want to be where the prostitutes are. I want to be where the drug addicts are. I want to be where the alcoholics are. I want to be the refuges. I, I'm not afraid of that. And so I said, praise the Lord, we'll take it. So we set up that tent there, and I had a, I had a, a, a we divided the back part of the canvas old tent, and we put all the chairs and the stage out, and I got some guys to work with me, another evangelist, and, and we'd go, and all morning long, we'd just walk the floor in behind that, 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 that curtain, and we'd be crying out to God, and we'd be praying, and the Lord spoke to me one day. He said, get ready, they're going to start falling under the power of God as they walk by the tent. And so I'd be up there preaching, and all of a sudden, they start dropping, they'd, they'd, and there was an old lady walking by and I said to her, I said get ready go out and bring that lady in I said not that when she fell an old lady fell she didn't have a heart attack the power of God hit her she's probably in her late 60s early 70s that ain't too old to me anymore but they ran out and they brought her in and she got gloriously born again there was an atheist standing behind the tree he and and and, and he, he 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 was standing watching us and you know what to make a long story short his name was George Fitzgerald he was a treasurer over the Huntington Fair and he was standing there watching us minister and preach these nuts these maniacs speaking in tongues and dancing and shouting while all the people walking by you're a spectacle we had more people outside of the tent than in the tent but you know what praise the Lord three months later that man got gloriously born again filled with the Holy Ghost and he became an elder in the church he said, I caused the Gentiles to become obedient in word and deed. How? By mighty signs and wonders, not by flyers, not by tracks, not by any other method, not by programs, but by mighty signs and wonders. Hallelujah. In the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I want you to show you that the ministry of Jesus did not really, really begin until he got filled with the Holy Ghost. And I, I like what Brother Mark said to me this morning. Because many, for many years I've meditated on the commandments of Christ. And there's 150 of them that he gave. And he told us we're supposed to preach the commandments of Christ, but most preachers don't preach. But that's what he said. Go teach all men my, and, and to obey my commandments. He had commandments and it's not legalism. We love to do them because we love him. And this is love that we keep his commandments and his commandments that are grievous. We love them. I, lo I don't know about you. Some people, they love to cook and other people hate it. It depends upon what you love. I love the word of God. I love the will of God. I love to meditate. I love to pray. There's been times when I stood in the pulpit and, and, and I had been, I, I, there's been times when the spirit of God came on me and I'd pray eight, not eight hours straight like it was nothing, just a power, of just praying, 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 days on end, days on end. And then I'd have to stop and go preach. I didn't even want to go preach. I wanted to go pray. I'll be honest with you. I'd really rather just go home right now and meditate upon the word of God. <laughs> I'd rather do that, but we got to preach the gospel. And so I'm telling you what, man, you just begin to get caught up in Jesus. And so Mark said to me this morning, Pastor Mike, do you know what the first commandment it is in the Bible? Uh, what Jesus taught. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, okay, uh, Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit, for uh, they, they shall be comforted, and, and, or they shall inherit, whatever. And, and, and he said, no, Pastor Mike, it's in Matthew 4, 4. I thought, okay, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's the first commandment. Whew. See, I've had, he said, Pastor Mike, why have you had so many visitations? Since the word of God hit in my heart. I know why, because the moment I got born again, I began to meditate and memorize scriptures, 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 scriptures. That's how my mind thinks. 90% of the time when something comes up, the first thing that happens to me is the scripture comes to my mind. It's, it's, like, it's like ammunition in your gun belt, you might say. 
the word of God, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. For the weapons are warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. For he sent his word and he healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. The word of God, I've hid it in my heart. And what did he say? And God went with them, confirming his word with signs following. Not confirming your opinions, not confirming your feelings, not confirming your opinions, confirming his word. Why do you think the devil wants to keep the word of God out of your heart? Why do you think he's trying to distract us? Why do you think he's trying to stop us from hiding the word of God in our heart? But now Jesus didn't begin his ministry until he came out of the wilderness. He had been tempted, and the first commandment he discovered was, Thou sh man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Now it's amazing how all things work together for good to them that love God, that are caught according to his purpose. Brother Mark didn't know that statement would trigger something in my heart. I mean, it's like gears shifting inside of you, and there's a shift, boom. And faith exploded inside of me. And then as I was meditating upon what I was supposed to minister this morning, something shifted again. And it's just like, it's almost like the old cars. Remember the old cars, man? When you have to put, maybe they still have them, I guess, where you begin, and you got to shift just right. Do you know what? There is an old car I had. I learned that, that transmission so good, I could speed shift. You all ever speed shift? Man, you're running down that road. Take you, you pump, you let off the gas for a moment, you go whoop and go into the second gear. You don't even have to use the clutch. And you're just, man, you're booking. I'm telling you there's a place in the Holy Ghost where you can begin to speed shift. Amen. You can begin to speed shift. And you don't want to, and don't worry about it. In the kingdom of God, there is no speed limit. It's as fast as you can run. It's as much as you can believe for. And matter of fact, Jesus said, I lived in Germany for a while, and they had an Autobahn. And I would be going down the road. I thought I was going fast 80 miles an hour when all of a sudden the car would pass me up doing 110, a Mercedes. And then another car would pass me up, going up to 160. I think there was a car. It looked like a little wedge of cheese. It went by me so fast, my whole Audi began to shake. I think he must have been hitting over 200 miles an hour on the Autobahn. And that's how God wants us to be in the Holy Ghost. Pastor Mike, aren't you worried you'll, we'll pass you in the Holy Ghost? No, go for it, man. I might just latch onto your bumper and come along for the ride. Praise the Lord. Come on, man. Come on, men of God, women of God. Let's rise up in the Holy Ghost. Let's begin to move in the realm of faith. Let's begin to move in the supernatural. Let's begin to believe God for the impossible. You were made, you were created to walk in the realm of faith. Let's, let's get out of that realm of unbelief. Let's spread our wings and begin to fly like an eagle. Let's run and not be weary. Let's walk and not faint. Let's climb up over the walls. Let's run through a true praise the Lord. Jesus. So Jesus comes out. Jesus comes out of the wilderness and he's full of the power of the Holy Ghost. And the first thing he does, the Bible says, he turns the water into wine. Woo! He wants to change you. He wants to transform you. Yes, you're just ordinary, dull, dead water, but he wants to turn you into living wine. And you know what? It's a wine that will cause you to get drunk in the Holy Ghost. He wants to turn you into wine. He said, I'm nothing... I'm nothing but plain Jane. I, I'm, I'm, I'm dead. I'm, I'm dull. I, I'm nobody. You're the perfect candidate. He didn't take some wine and make it better. He took water and turned it into wine. It was this in an earthen vessels. How many know that our bodies are nothing but earthen vessels? But that soul within you can be turned to living wine, praise the Lord. But you got to get rid of the old wineskins. You got to realize that this thing ain't going to be done. See, I, I, we used to have a church, church of about 600. And I'm sorry to say the reason why our church was about that big was because I was one of the first churches that fell into seeker friendly, the seeker friendly movement. Give the people what they want and they'll come. And they did. But they were carnal. They were fleshly. They had no hunger for God. They didn't know how to pray. They didn't know how to cry out. They didn't care about the word of God. I'm not picking on them because what, what draw them is what kept them. You want a bunch of flies? You can just take a, take a shovel full of cow poop and you'll get a bunch of flies. But you know what? If you want some bees, you've got to have a bunch of honey. Hello? 
And so the Lord spoke to me and said, son, you just got a bunch of people. No wonder there's so much fighting and bickering and backbiting and gossip because they're just carnal people. They don't love me. You brought them in with all these little trinkets and all these little gimmicks and all of these little just good, like a YMCA or a YWCA. He says, I don't want that. He says, you need to repent. I repented, and I stood up and apologized, and we went down from 600 people down to about 20 people, including my family. You know what? But that's okay. Because God said the next time, the next time, the next time, you're not talking hundreds, you're talking thousands and thousands, but they're going to be coming because of the power of the Holy Ghost. They're going to be coming because God is in that place. And I'm sorry to say you can't go to most churches and God is there. You got religion. Jesus came out in the power of the Spirit, turned the water to wine, and from then on, man, he began to do so many amazing miracles. He began to do so much awesome stuff. I'm telling you what, matter of fact, I, I just, we'll, we'll go to Matthew 11, but I'm going to show you what it says in, in John chapter 21. Listen to this. Why would he do so many miracles? Why would he do this? And in and, 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 and verse 24 of chapter 21, this is the dis dis disciple which testifieth of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Listen, verse 25. And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Amen. Do you know what he's talking about? Signs and wonders and miracles. I mean, just signs and wonders and miracles. When I was in the Philippines, I'd hold a crusade, and it's easy to get miracles over there because, because they're, just, they're just simple people. I'm a simple person. I'm not analytical. I've never been analytical. I'm not a thinker. Say, thank God. People who are th constantly thinking, thinking, thinking. I shut my mind down. I said, Lord, your word. He told me to, do, uh, uh, to have church every day. I said, okay, Lord, he told me to go ahead and sign a $500,000 contract and begin to broadcast by satellite and by all the other technology. No ministers lined up, not the right equipment, and we've been doing it since March. Hallelujah. Going into millions of homes, signed a $500,000 contract, and it takes a miracle every month for us to keep on functioning. But God does it. I don't know how he does it, but he does it. It's like one time, Brother Jesse, who just walked out, we kept every time we'd go down to the bank, we'd have more cash than what had come in Sunday morning. And so one Sunday, I took Jesse aside, and I, one Monday morning, I said, okay, Jesse, here's the pile of cash. Didn't seem like that much. You count the pile, I'll count the pile. So we did it. We wrote it down. We were the same. I said, count it again, Jesse. He counted it again, and I counted it again. And it was the same amount. And so I went down to the bank, put in the deposit, and they came back over the window like in most situations. says, hey, uh, Pastor Mike, yeah, well, you're wrong again. I, I said, okay. I, I said, what's wrong? Well, you got more here than more cash than what you counted. I said, okay. I said, how, how much we got? You got, now get hold. He said, you got $500 more Hallelujah. than what you counted. Well, I don't believe it. I don't care if you don't believe it. It was in our bank account. We had five, you can ask Brother Jesse, $500 more. Two winters ago, our LP tank, when it hits empty, is empty. I mean, this building sucks heat when you heat this, this room, and that's why we went to wood stoves this last winter, because we've had church every day, three times a day, and actually four times a day, including the time of prayer, and we're going to have at least five times a day here real soon. But I tell you what, our fuel tank was empty. It was a Sunday morning, and usually you begin to smell the gas. I think I might have smelled some. I went out there, and it was empty. I had no money. I laid my hands on a tank, and I said, in the name of Jesus, you'll keep producing gas into the winter's over. And so I went in just say, thank you, God, thank you, God. The gas is still flowing, hallelujah. Well, that month, Sunday, the, the, the heaters kept running. That night, the heaters kept running. Well, the midweek service, the heaters kept running. The next Sunday, it's on empty. I said to the people, go out and take a look. For two and a half months, hallelujah. we kept heating the building with no gas in the tank. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I don't believe it. It don't matter if you believe it. It made me a believer. Why does God do signs and wonders in your life? Because he wants you to believe. Why does he say, put your hand in my side and put your finger in my hand? He wants you to believe. He's got to get you to believe. Because it's only where people believe that he can show up. He wants to show up through you. Did you know the Bible says you are for signs and wonders in the earth? Did you know that? 
Did you know that when you got converted and you gave Jesus everything and you began to go after God, people are watching you and go, let's see if this is for real. I had one guy, a good friend of mine, uh, one of my closest friends, and we were both pretty rough sinners together, and I was way worse than him. I got born again, and his name was Mike Marcus. I told Mike, I said, oh, praise the Lord, and he knew I had a speech impediment. God took it away, you know, and I said, oh, Mike, Mike, let me tell you about Jesus. He said, you come back to me two years, I believe. I went back in two years. He said, oh, you come back in five years, and I came back in five years. I caught him up a couple years ago. I said, Mike, it's been over 30-some years. Do you believe yet? Because I was most unlikely a candidate to ever be a preacher. Look what it says here. Look there in Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. Jesus then began to upbraid the cities where most of his mighty works, say mighty works, most of his, most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. What are mighty works for? To get people to repent. That's what they're for to get him to die to self. This is Matthew chapter 11, verse 20. And why would he do most of his money's works there? Because he was trying to rip the unbelief out of their hearts. Come on, man. I'm telling you what, this world right now is like a dry, dry forest that hasn't had rain in years. I'm telling you what, if there will be a spark of the miraculous, of the supernatural, of signs and wonders, there will be such a Holy Ghost. I had a vision last year when I was out in Indiana. I saw the globe of the earth. I saw a little fire spark. I'm just telling you what I saw. It's not because I got a big head or because I think I'm somebody, because I know I'm nothing. But there was a little spark of fire and it started here in the Gettysburg area and this little fire sprung up and then all of a sudden it began to spread and all of a sudden before you know it, a flame began to go out to the north, the south, the west and the east and it covered the earth and the whole earth was on fire and I said, Lord, what is that? He said, that's the fire of my spirit. I'm about to sweep the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, would God do that? in a run-down little church, in a cow field outside of a little town called Gettysburg? Yes, he would. Yeah. I never wanted to be here. I hated Gettysburg. If there was any town I hated, I hated Pennsylvania, but I hated Gettysburg. I remember one time I came through Gettysburg, and I said, oh, Lord, I'm so glad I don't live in Gettysburg, but now I've been here for almost 30 years. God wouldn't let me go. You can ask my kids. I said, oh, oh, God, please deliver me from Gettysburg. And one time I tried to sell the land, and we had a bunch of, we had an auctioneer out here, and I had a minimum, God spoke to me, my heart, a minimum amount, $570,000, I think it was, or four seventy, dollars and they were only 10000 away, and there was a group of people that really wanted it. And the auctioneer got upset, and there's businessmen standing around here because the building before the fall of 2007 or 2008, nine, it was in 2000. And five, I think it was, and the Lord, and 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 and, and there were ten thousand dollars away from hitting the minimum, and the building was valued at three million. The property, everything we had, and and they were ten thousand dollars away. And the auctioneer got so mad, he said, "Let's go into your office, Pastor Mike." So we went to my office, and he said, "We got one, we got three choices." I said, "What's that?" He said, "Either we can go out and try to do it again, or number two, we can lower the price." I said, "We're not doing that." Or number three, we can take it off of the auction block. And the Spirit of God spoke to my heart; it was so strong and so real, it was audible. He said. Take it off the auction block. Hallelujah. We're out there. The men's hands who were, were wanting to bid. I have a neighbor who was a plumbing shop. It had been a perfect place for his plumbing equipment. The land alone was worth more than that. His hands, they were, they, I'm telling you what, if you could have been there, it was so, it was so weird. Their mouths were shut. Their hands were at their side, and they couldn't move and open their mouth. God was keeping them because he said, I have a job. I have a purpose. I have a plan here. <sighs> Come on, man, get excited. You're not here by accident. You that are watching, you're not here. You're not watching by accident. Say it, I'm not here by accident. Come on, God has a plan for you. You just got to die your plans. So he did these mighty works in verse 21. Woe unto you. And he begins to call, call out the cities. Woe unto you. He said, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyra and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. 
Look what it says in verse 26. He says, but it's going to be more tolerable for Sidon and Tyra than judgment for you. And in verse 23, he calls out another town. And he says, for if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. For in other words, if, if he would have done these signs and wonders in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have still been here. They would have repented. Pastor Mike, this generation won't repent. I'm telling you the reason why. They haven't seen mighty signs and wonders. Faith will come rushing in. Now, we've had a little signs and wonders here. I, I remember when, when, uh, when Mark Moore and his family came, and they were sitting over here, and Brother Joseph, he'll tell you this. It was a, it was, the doors were all closed. It was just a, I don't know, don't know when it was, in the fall or in the spring. I don't know when it was, but they were sitting over here. And as I was preaching, we had no fans running, nothing. And I would feel, I, literally, I don't, go, I don't talk about what I feel. I'd feel... There's times that oil flows from my head and comes from my tear ducts. I don't talk about it a lot. There's been times when oil has flowed from my hands. There's been times when we had what they called gold dust. We don't talk about it. There's been times when feathers came. I don't talk about it a lot because people attack these things. But God, he spoke to me. He said, son, I can manifest myself any way I want. He said, I made the gold. I made the silver. He said, I do signs and wonders. I just didn't tell you what they were because there are so many. You couldn't write them all down. And I didn't want you to seek in signs and wonders, but I'll do what I want. There's been times when this place has been filled with the fragrance of heaven. There's been times when it was raining in the spirit. You could feel the rain hitting you, but there was no natural rain. But I, I'm a, Mark and them are sitting on the front seat, and I can tell that the Spirit of God is all over them. And I walk up to them, and they said, Pastor Mike, did you feel the wind? Do you have any fans on? I said, no. They said, a wind was blowing against us. A wind was blowing against us, but nobody else felt the wind. These things are real, people. I mean, we have smelt. I know we had a women's conference, and, and it was called, uh, it was, what was it called, Michael? Do you remember fragrance? Uh, 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 the fragrance of heaven or something like that? And we had gone out. I went to a spe spe special place in Lancaster, and I bought, I bought the incense they said that was in the Holy of Holies, and I had it all set up back there in a little cup, and, and I had smelt some of it already. I had burned a little bit of it. And so I got it in the cup, and none of it had been in the sanctuary, and I'm getting ready for Sister Joanna Hurden, which is the daughter of Jack Cole, getting ready to tell me, okay, Pastor Mike, light the incense. And she's up here preaching all of a sudden. The whole room was filled with the incense of, 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 the, of, of the aroma of the Holy of Holies, and she's preaching, and she stops, and she says, Pastor Mike, everybody could smell it. The room was full of it. Said, Pastor Mike, I told you not to light the incense, and she wasn't ugly uh, until I told you to. I lift it up I says sister Joanna here it is I've not lit it <laughs> don't tell me their faith didn't just shoot up a notch don't tell me see and he says mighty signs and wonders is in order to make the heathen and the Gentiles and the Jews obedient to the faith I believe with all my heart Let's look at just a couple more scriptures. John chapter 4. Faith will come. We've got to believe God for mighty signs and wonders, guys. And the only way mighty signs and wonders are going to happen is when, when we die to self. We've got to die to self, man. We've just got to die to our plans, our ideals. We've got to fill ourselves with the word. Oh, Pastor Mike, I, I ain't got time to memorize 10 books of the Bible. Let me tell you something. You don't have to memorize 10 books of the Bible. Mary Woodworth Edder, there's a book out called Signs and Wonders. I, I, I've always read all these books because I wanted my faith inspired of how God moved other than in the Bible. And, and Mary Woodworth Edder, there's a book out called Signs and Wonders. It's about 400 pages. And this little lady, about four foot eight, oh, did she move in the power of God. I mean, she moved in the power of God. But she was in prayer one day, and she said the heavens were opened up, and she said God downloaded the whole Bible into her mind in a minute. How would you like to have that to happen? I told you the Lord spoke to me and said, you don't know my word. And so I began to meditate upon the word, and I memorized the book of Galatians. And it, my head was hurting because I was trying to memorize and memorize and memorize. It took me days to memorize a chapter, and then I had to get it down in my heart. And then I took the book of Ephesians, and my head is hurting. It's splitting. It's hurting. And then I got into the first or the second chapter of the book of Philippians, and I'm in my office, and I'm trying to memorize. I'm trying to memorize. I'm trying to memorize. And all of a sudden, you can go on the web and see me quoting these books. And the Lord said, son, I want you to go back and not only hide those 
those books in your heart once again. He said, but I want you to preach them under the power of the Holy Spirit. I was pe preaching the book of James by memory in a little country called Suriname down in, 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 in South America between Brazil, between the two Guatemalas, uh, English speaking and French speaking, and, 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 and I need healing for my eyes. So I, I, I can see you, but your, your faces are a little bit foggy to me. And so uh, the, the outer area, is, it's a real deep church. It's one of the largest churches in Suriname, and it holds like probably 2,000 people, and, and, and God opened the door. I, when I went there, I just found myself in their pulpit, and I'm preaching from memory the, the book of, of, of James, and I had spent days just going over the book of James like when you're cooking a turkey in the oven and, and that morning I stood up and I didn't feel nothing I began to preach the book of James by memory and I know I'm running out of time and I can't get nowhere and I could tell the apostle the head apostle which is a woman was 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 prancing like a like a cat in the cage she wanted me to get done but as I was preaching something was happening out there in the crowd I saw lots of moose and my, I didn't know what was going on and so I gave the altar call finally and the whole altar filled with people weeping and wailing and crying and a couple days later, and, and probably Sister, sister uh, 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 Rafis can confirm this. She, she watches us. She's a tremendous minister, and she watches my videos in Suriname, and she'll confirm this. And she, a couple days later, she, we're driving down a road, and she says to me, she said, uh, Brother Mike, wasn't that amazing Sunday morning? Amazing? I was disappointed. Uh, yeah, people were weeping and crying. And I was disappointed. I said, well, what do you mean, sister? She said, oh, what God was doing. I said, well, what was God doing? She said, as you were quoting the book of James, she said the power of God hit the church and people were being thrown out of their chairs all over the place. Hallelujah. Little whirlwinds were throwing people out of their chairs. I didn't even know it. Hallelujah. Whoa! She said, all those people that came running up front, she said they were the leaders of the church. I said, oh, I didn't know it. So I'm into the second chapter of Philippians when all of a sudden the room I was in disappeared. Boom, there was a gigantic lake. And I looked up into a blue sky and there was not a ripple on the lake. Next thing, this drop of water comes floating down and it hit the water and ripples went out and then it was gone. I said, what was that? I picked up my Bible and my mind had become photogenic. I could memorize a chapter in an hour. Something shifted in my gray matter. It became a sponge for the word. And before he knew it, I had nine books of the Bible memorized. Why didn't you keep it up? Got caught up running things, taking care of things, doing things. I was serving God, but I didn't give myself to that place of prayer and the word that I should do. You all still here? Look what Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 26. So Jesus came again unto Capernaum of Galilee, Canaan of Galilee, we had made the water wine. We're right back to the first miracle. And there was a certain noble man, it's John chapter 4, verse 46, whose son was sick at Capernaum. And when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judah unto Galilee, he went on to him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, listen, verse 48. Now, some other translations say something different. This is accurate. Listen, except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You know, like I said, 2008, I'm up early in the morning praying. God downloads into my mind 40 different aspects of faith with up to 28 points in each one. And then he drops into my heart, faith comes. 20 ways, actually it comes more than 20 ways. But faith kills this progressive revelation as you go deeper. Faith, and I was at Rainbow Bible Training Center. I only knew a couple ways that faith came. And one of them was this. The Lord spoke to me and said, they will not believe without signs and wonders. I said, what? He said, faith will come if they see signs and wonders. I said, Lord, show me that. He took me right to this scripture. He said, except they see signs and wonders, they'll not believe. He said, why do you think I did so many signs and wonders? Because they were full of unbelief. He said, I had to rip the unbelief out of them. Nothing else, good preaching would not rip it out. Reading books would not rip it out. Hearing people sing will not rip it out. The only thing that will rip people out of the bondage of unbelief, listen, the sign of unbelief is lack of prayer, lack of being in the Bible, lack of witnessing, lack of going to church, lack of, lack, lack. It's when people lack these things, emotional upheavals, up and down, up and down, inconsistency. Did we not begin in Acts chapter 4 where they were all in one accord? They all had one heart, one soul. Their great grace was upon them all. How come that? That's not true because they have not the foundation of faith built on the power of God. 
How can we expect them? How can we expect people today to be consistent if they don't see God? They need to see God. People need to see God. They need to see God in me. They said when, they said when, Cal, when, when uh, Mayor, uh, Mayor Woodworth Edder would preach, there was times she, she would literally glow like a light bulb, shine like a light. That's happened to me here and there once in a while where I began to shine like a light, but it can get so bright to where people got to cover their eyes like Moses. Why did they have to see a fire by night and a cloud by day? Why? Because they would not believe otherwise. I'm telling you right now, you can talk to your blue in the face to somebody and not get them to believe. You can quote them scripture from A to Z and they will not believe and they will not get free. People have got to see that the church has got to see signs and wonders. Well, you know, signs and wonders are for the unbelievers. Hello? Hello? What? 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 Listen, I'm not picking anybody. I finally had to go to the doctor. I had to get up because I was getting my CDL license. I walked into the doctor's office. You know, this was last year to get my CDL to ride, drive this big bus out here to take people to Indiana. He goes through the, ask me questions, gets done, and he said, okay. My kids, I've always took my family there to that medical doctor. It's not the same doctor anymore. It's another doctor. And he says to me, he says, uh, <clears throat> he says well, when's the last time you've seen a doctor? I said, let me see. I said, it might, it might have been 36 years ago. He said, what? I didn't go, I don't use doctors. People don't have wisdom. He said, what? I said, no, I haven't seen a doctor. I haven't needed a doctor for 36 years. Now, it doesn't mean I didn't have problems. I had a hernia. I had a busted kneecap. I had a broken back. I had the, the symptoms of cancer three times in my body. I, had a, I, I, had a, I mean, I've had all kinds of attacks, but God healed me every time. I'd have to wrestle, I'd have to fight, I'd have to take a hold of the word of God and not let go. You know, I'm telling you what, man, I've got a book called Living Around the Miraculous, 130 True Stories. I had a broken foot one time, and, and it was busted up black and blue, and the Lord spoke to me and said, you're healed. I got so mad at the devil, I slammed it down as hard as I could, and each time I slammed it down, I blacked out. My wife saw it the third time I came to, and she was looking over the top of me in our master bedroom. She said, I can't watch you do this anymore. You're making me sick. She left. I slammed it down again, passed out. The fifth time I slammed it down, my, hip, my foot was completely, instantly healed. I mean, instantly the swelling was gone, the black and blueness was gone, and the bones were knitted together, and I was on my way. Well, I don't believe that. I don't care. Everybody in the church that worked, that worked here, they saw my big black, blue, swelling, busted foot. But God did it. But see, people, see, I was going to say this. How come so many people are running to doctors, doctors, doctors? I thought Jesus was our doctor. Well, Pastor Mike, if you tell them to stop going, then, then tell them to believe God. They can't believe God. They can't believe God. They just can't. I started weeping this morning. I said, Lord, they can't. They want to. God, they want to believe you. They want to trust you. They just can't. They need to see mighty signs and wonders. He says, he says as we close here, he says in John chapter 14, he, he's talking and he's preaching to his disciples and, 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 and Thomas speaks up and he says, oh Lord, just show us who you are, then we'll believe. He says, have I been with you so long, Thomas, and you still don't know who I am? He said, if you don't believe me for the word's sake, believe me for the work's sake. He said, if I can't convince you by what I'm preaching and what I'm teaching, by what I'm saying, he said, then look at all the signs and wonders and miracles and be thou not unbelieving, but be thou believing. You can stop the recording.